Hey guys, welcome back to our lecture series. I'm Ted, your host, and for today's lecture, we're going to be picking right back up with part two of our examination of the home front during the United States Civil War. Uh, and to be, uh, and for this, I'm just going to dive straight into it. We're not going to do our uh, customary recap. Uh, we won't do a recap, a customary recap, until we finish with our um, our overview of the of the home front. Uh, and so with that said, uh, let me jump right into saying that both sides uh, finance the war through similar means. They use paper, money, loans, and taxes. Uh, in the Confederate States, uh, taxes made up about 5% of the war revenue. Uh, loans about 30 and paper money 60. Um, the paper money was worthless by the end of the war. The paper money uh, began to uh, depreciate in value almost as soon as it was issued. Um, it would lead to terrible inflation in the Confederate States. Um, uh, the, uh, uh, there were a number of reasons for that. One was that the paper money was not backed by gold or silver. Uh, it took 46, uh, an estimated uh, 46, uh, 46 to 50 Confederate dollars. Uh, to purchase what one Confederate dollar had purchased in 1861. Uh, the inflation spiraled out of control. Uh, it crippled the local economy, uh, local economies in the Confederate States. Um, the United States blockade factored into this as well. Half the blockade made goods scarce, uh, foreign goods scarce. Um, the, the presence of the United States military disrupted the internal movement of products. Uh, so things, uh, so products that were produced in the uh, deep south, the, uh, the the lower tier of southern states, could not make it to uh, upper tier uh, southern states. Similarly, uh, goods in from the eastern uh, slave states could not make it to the western slave states. If if Texas didn't, if Texas couldn't produce it locally, Texas wasn't going to get it. If Florida couldn't produce it locally, Florida wasn't going to get it, unless Florida could get it from southern Georgia or eastern. Uh, Alabama, it, it just wasn't going to happen. You didn't even look at, you didn't even think to look that way. Um, the uh, the this these were the uh, the major reasons that the Confederate States um, economy uh, could not really rise up to the task of financing a mid nineteenth century war. Um, another another factor was this. Uh, unlike other regions in the world, most of the wealth in the Confederate States was invested in land and slaves. Okay, and now by uh, in contrast, the United States, um, uh, the United States had a very stable currency in the greenbacks. Um, the Civil War is the first time that America, that the United States uh, currency, the United States money, was green. Uh, what was issued in, in, uh, in green bills? Um, about 50% of the war money came from uh, from uh, just being financed by that paper money, by that very stable greenbacks. Uh, another 20% came from taxes. Taxes rose uh, throughout the war, uh, and a roughly 65% came from war bonds. And now the war bonds um, were bonds bought by citizens. This sort of forced, uh, foreshadowed other instances in American history, like the Spanish-American War, World War One, and World War Two, in which citizens financed the war through war bonds. Um, and there was a uh, inflation also affected the uh, United States, but didn't reach anywhere near the catastrophic levels that it did the the Confederate States. Now both sides. Uh, were, were using modern arms. They were using rifles, uh, rifled muskets, um, and and, uh, and uh, the new innovation of the Mene ball. Now the Confederate states imported most of their arms, most of their rifles. Uh, they managed to produce uh, a few and to capture a number of rifles. Now the United States imported roughly uh, one fifth to one third. Uh, well, not one fifth, um, one fourth to one third of their rifles. And produced the rest domestically. Uh, they produced ammunition. Um, they, they produced better ammunition, as a matter of fact, than the Confederates. Uh, the Confederates' ammunition, uh, particularly their artillery, had a, a reputation for being unreliable. 
um, Confederate units would often tell Confederate artillerymen not to fire above their head because of how unreliable that ammunition was, um, how unreliable their ordinance was. Now, uh, the Confederate states built larger munition plants in the, Uni in, uh, in the United States and, uh, and what would be um, considered the United States. They, they built the largest plants um, in the United States. As a matter of fact, the uh, munition plant in Augusta, Georgia was among the largest in the world. Um, the Confederate States, uh, they did a very a remarkable job of shifting from a primarily agrarian economy to an, to an industrial economy, but they still lagged behind the United States um, as far as industrial output and capacity is is uh, is regarded. Uh, the United States began uh, the process, began the tradition, I should say, of oversupplying troops. Uh, at this point, the Confederate States were unable to really support their troops, but uh, but not. Um, but, but it's not as excessive as most people thought. Uh, the major problem with the uh, Confederacy and supplying their troops was that they, they lacked the, the, the internal infrastructure to really move the goods to where they were needed. Um, roads were a poor quality. There were limited railroads. There were no real, no, really no canals. And again, um, the reason that the South had fought, it, uh, had fought so long and so hard against internal improvements was... Uh, it was easy to move large bulk cargo by uh, by either flat boat or by steamboat. Um, it was thought that if uh, that if the internal improvement, the roads, canals, bridges, rivers, uh, bridge, uh, dams, and so forth, um, railroads, and so forth, if all these things have been introduced into the and to the slave holding south then it would make it that much easier for slaves to run away so there was a very uh, prime incentive to not uh, to not um, keep up with all that all of that and while it did impede the movement of slaves from let's say the deep south to uh, a free state or to the upper south it also uh, during the war impeded the movement of goods from the deep south to the upper south where they were needed um, uh, now with that said uh, I'd like to dive uh, jump straight into looking at the economic aspects of the war um, as far as uh, as far as they're concerned and we begin so by by looking at the United States economy um, the United States economy uh, shrugged off all of uh, all of the roadblocks that could have been uh, that could have, that were thrown at it they simply powered through it all um, it persisted and it weathered political uh, political shifts uh, and the everyday hardships uh, that were magnified by the war uh, and they did so in a number of ways um, particularly uh, the the very heated election, I should, uh, I want to say, of 1864, which pitted Lincoln against General George McClellan for the presidency. Now, uh, now, now, uh, looking at politics, uh, politics for a minute, the Confederate states very consciously tried to avoid political factions and parties in their political system. They opted to try to cooperate with uniform consensus in policy making. Okay, it was a, it will be a, a very interesting experiment uh, to to see unfold uh, examining the war. Now, the continual military campaigns distorted the flow of the Confederate economy. The United States, by contrast, proved to be fully capable of meeting domestic war needs um, for 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 her populace and uh, her military commitments. Furthermore, the absence of so many slave states in the United States Congress allowed for the Republican-dominated Congress, uh, the free states, to pass legislation with near uniformity, creating a fiscal policy, a, a fiscal platform that will propel the United States uh, to among the, the top of the industrial powers. Now, the war brought enormous dislocation to the Confederate civilian population. Um, 
The civilians in faraway locations like Florida and Texas were little impacted by the war, unlike the vast stretches of Northern Virginia that saw a yearly occupation by the armies of Northern Virginia and the Potomac. Uh, this, this in turn led to a number of Confederate civilians uh, becoming refugees. Uh, despite that, the majority of the Confederate civilian population remained in favor of secession and supported their government's wartime actions. Now, there was a period of near uniformity, as I stated earlier, in the early months of the war in the Confederate states. Politicians of all backgrounds and leanings uh, presented a united front. Um, uh, they tried hard to suppress the formation of factions. Um, they understood that the that the faction and party politics uh, that that had played the United States, uh, the early Republic, would undermine their war effort. This period of uniformity did not last long, however, as the old political uh, divisions reappeared uh, in the upland areas like Virginia's Trans Allegheny counties, uh, the area that would later become the the nucleus of the state of West Virginia in uh, the upland and hilly regions of Alabama and of Texas. Um, these, uh, the DD people expressed very strong unionist sentiment. Um, they, uh, and also the eastern region of Tennessee, you know, uh, the, these areas uh, resisted uh, Confederate attempts. Um, they, they, they mounted their own internal resistance to what the Confederate government was doing. Uh, the old guard Democrats objected to the introduction of more centralized and broad power for the for the uh, the national government, the Richmond government. Um, Jefferson Davis, his government in Richmond, levied taxes, imposed conscription, uh, which which occurred for the first time in United States history. Um, uh, the Confederate and, and and more importantly, the Confederate states proved. Uh, the Confederate States Congress proved to be a largely ineffectual and inept body. Um, Jeff Davis. Now, now Jeff Davis was a very devoted Confederate nationalist. He, um, with only great reluctance, did he accept the, the defeat and the failure of the Confederate States. Um, Jeff Davis approved a number of the domestic measures to prosecute the war. His undoing as president was that he tried to do too much. He, uh, he was rigid, very rigid. He played favorites with military commanders and political subordinates. Um, and, and he really began, he really, he really sort of drifted into this illusion. He lost uh, touch with uh, reality, really. He, he was very detached from everyday matters. And he became a, a hated figure in the process playing military favorites, uh, being too rigid, and living in, in this illusion, uh, illusionary world, he became a hated figure. He became the object of scorn and ridicule. Now, the effort to do without parties failed. Um, there, was, there, were no, there were no named parties like there were in the United States, but there were pro and anti-Jefferson Davis factions in the government and, and at the state level. Um, old guard Democrats um, and central government power supporters, they they vied with each other, uh, and and this split this this split uh, amongst uh, Confederate political leaders, it also impacted his cabinet because Alexander Stevens, the sitting vice president of the Confederate States, proved to be one of the most anti-Davis politicians in the Confederate States. He was rabid. He was he was rabidly opposed to Davis. Now the Confederate uh, economy uh, suffered, has have noted from the from uh, depreciated currency, uh, over reliance on King Cotton diplomacy, and of course the presence of multiple armies in multiple different regions, mul multiple different areas all across the Upper South. Uh, that negatively impacted the agricultural cycle, not to mention the ongoing blockade at, uh, uh, at, uh, at very um, hotspot areas along their coastline. All the major cities were closed down, but um, Mobile, 
Mobile was the only major port, the only major coastal city that was still operational uh, deep into the war. But all the other big hotspots have been have been closed down, and while bootlegging did uh, survive. The, uh, the blockade running ships were very small, so only limited amounts of the Confederate goods got out and they were not getting good prices for this for this small amount. Um, now, uh, now to compound this, um, the limited internal transportation system that the South had broke down early in the war and this resulted in the bizarre phenomena of the Confederate states not being able to get food, uh, foodstuffs, industrial goods, and other war material from where they were produced to where they were needed the most. Um, that that is from these various regions within the Confederate states to the to the front lines. Um, the lack of an, of the ability of any sort of ability to repair rail lines in the Confederate states, or even more importantly, to build locomotives compounded the transportation system in the south and and and, uh, and lastly to touch on inflation before we uh, before we break um, in our home front lecture series uh, inflation um, was was, uh, was buoyed by the by the breakdown of their internal transportation system uh, and inflation inflicted a cruel burden on the Confederate civilian population prices for everyday items soared um, we, we have reports of, ch of a, a, the price of a single chicken being $15, uh, a pair of trousers being $100, um, a barrel of flour costing $1,000. Uh, to put this in comparison, the, uh, uh, and, and I, I, just want, I just want to show you what a Confederate soldier was earning. So, a, a chicken, a whole chicken cost fifteen dollars well the confederate soldiers the average confederate soldier was only earning eighteen dollars a month so an entire month's pay was going towards one chicken and you had three dollars left over uh so you had to make that chicken last for an entire month um uh they, they, the Confederate soldiers were essentially working for free with that type of inf with that type of uh, inflation. Um, the period also saw food riots across the South, and most notably, there was a major bread riot in Richmond in 1863. Um, the government, uh, the the poor movement of goods, the weak currency, uh, inflation. Um, the government was uh, was really unable to uh, to help in those in, in, to help. Um, overcome that situation or they were unable to help and make any improvement any sort of headway in that situation and a barter economy uh, a barter system rose in many areas in the south um, and many people view this as the most harming uh, event the most the most uh, harmful to the war effort in the Confederate States the fact that that the inflation was so rampant that the people began to suffer more internally then from external factors, uh, and, that will, and with that said, I will break here. We'll break our examination of the home front, and we'll come back for part three of our examination of the home front. And as always, I am Ted. Hit like, subscribe, and comment. Uh, let me know what you thought about this lecture, and I'll see you guys next time for part three.